This presentation is going to focus on the Prophet Muhammad himself. Uh, some overall questions to consider. How can we assess the importance of the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, Islam and its early connections to the other monotheistic faiths. We sort of hit on this one last time. We're going to go back to it again. And how can we best explain Islam's rapid expansion? This is a big question, this last one. Uh, hmm, that would be a good... Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway. What we know about Muhammad's early life is pretty limited. There just isn't a whole lot in the historical record. Uh, but as much as we can tell, his life pretty much spans from about 570 to 632 AD. He is born in the wealthy city of Mecca into the powerful, and forgive my mispronunciation of this as I'm sure it's wrong, uh, Quraysh tribe. He was orphaned at an early age. He was raised by his uncle. His uncle was a trader. Uh, from the time that Muhammad was young, he was on and part of these caravans. He's illiterate. Uh, he never uh, mastered the Arabic language, which is, of course, so important for this region. Um, when he is older, he becomes a successful merchant himself. He goes into sort of the family business. He travels north. And you have to remember uh, about the region of the Arabian Peninsula at this time. It was in contact with Persian influences. It was in contact with Byzantine influences, so it's obviously going to have some connections to the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, it, it was in contact with uh, Jordan River Valley civilizations, all sorts of stuff. So you're going to see that once we start um, taking a look at uh, Islam itself. They don't deny a lot of these older ideas. Um, there's actually, in some respects, almost a reverence for some of these older religions. What Muhammad comes up with and what Islam ultimately becomes to its followers is it's the best version and the most current and the the perfect version of this one single all-powerful monotheistic faith or God. When he's 25 he marries his, um, this older wealthy widow. It was a little bit controversial at the time. Um, but he's pretty much set up for life. The fact that he has this financial stability is uh, really going to allow him to focus on uh, this new faith, this new religion. When Muhammad is about 40 years of age, um, he goes in to the outskirts of Mecca, into a cave in the middle of the desert, and while meditating in this cave, the voice of God, the Archangel Gabriel, um, begins to speak directly to him. Um, Gabriel is the voice of God, so it's basically God speaking to Muhammad. Now, ultimately, the recordings of what is said by Gabriel to Muhammad is going to end up being the holy text of Islam, and that is the Quran. Now, I said up here, he's illiterate. The Quran, if you translate what that word means. It means to recite. Okay? So he's not writing it down. This is getting written down for him by others. And he is basically given all this knowledge and information and is, you know, saying it back to people uh, verbatim. He is visited with this um, Archangel Gabriel on and off for the next 20 plus years. And what is so important is that the message is received in Arabic. Remember, think of the nature of the Arabian Peninsula. There are all sorts of different religious ideas in the region. There are all sorts of different governments that from time to time try to have power and influence over the Arabian Peninsula. Byzantines, Persians, uh, you know, whoever. And here is, you know, basically the voice of God telling somebody in Arabic the most truest version of the, you know, the holy story. That's the belief. Um, so that was, ex in many respects, a binding force that had never existed in the Arabian Peninsula before. A lot of these different tribes and these differences that w were abundantly clear before the lifetime of Muhammad are going to sort of go away in some respects with this uh, commanding binding force. We've seen this before. Religion is a binding force in the ancient world. Whether you were talking about the patron gods of individual city-states in ancient Greece, whether you were talking about the pharaoh, the god on earth of the ancient Egyptian civilization, or whether you were talking about you know the importance of the Roman mythology as this binding force, and it's so important to have everybody participating in these festivals and everything. This is a binding force. And 
what start what we saw last presentation with the Arabian Peninsula is really going to start to change. He starts converting people. He starts with his own family. Um, Abu Bakr becomes very important later on. Uh, starts preaching himself in, in about 612. Once he begins uh, these religious ideas and he starts talking about unity and binding force and crossing old tribal boundaries and everything. And something that, you know, before we even talk about any of the actual ideas of Islam, um, equality is something that is really expressed and um, focused on with this religion. And so a lot of your slaves and your lower classes all of a sudden start gathering together, getting together, and the old regime that's in charge of these various tribes, they start to feel a little bit uneasy about this. However, because it is such a binding and uniting force, it's going to rapidly spread. That message of equality um, in the Arabian Peninsula, where you, ha you, you do have some successful people. Muhammad came from a successful background, trader, uh, married well. Many people do not. Okay, many people are are extremely poor. This is, um, in many respects, at this time at least, an undeveloped area, as far as civilization is concerned. If you compare it to some of the other topics that we've discussed so far in this year, and so that's one of the big reasons why Islam is is going to expand rapidly throughout the Arab throughout the Arabian Peninsula at least, and for people who had been, who who excuse me were of Arabian descent, but they were followers of, say, Judaism or Christianity. Most oftentimes, they just, you know, told people they were uh, people of Abraham. Um, there were a lot of followers of the original teachings of Abraham, the founder of Judaism, in the Arabian Peninsula. Well, there's a connection to Jerusalem, and it is Muhammad's night journey. Even today, Jerusalem in modern-day Israel is important to all three monotheistic faiths. Muhammad supposedly with this night journey, what it is, you need to know, is his journey in one night, shocking, uh, but it's his journey in one night to the city of Jerusalem, a city that he had never been in, but after this supposed you know, night journey, he was able to describe in detail to people, uh, as far as the landmarks, what he was able to see. Once he goes to Jerusalem, he flies there, um, he ascends to heaven, and he receives the major tenets, whoop, the main tenets of Islam, uh, the five pillars of faith, which we'll talk about in the next presentation when we did, when we go in detail with beliefs. As he ascends into heaven, he keeps meeting different various saints and old religious figures, um, and you can read this in in the Quran, the holy text, and it really it really shows that connection to these earlier faiths. So, it's binding for people in the Arabian Peninsula, but it's also binding for people even if they already were uh, Jewish or Christian in this region as well. Okay. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of people, even though it's spreading rapidly amongst the lower classes, there's a lot of people that are uneasy about this new faith. And Muhammad is basically forced to leave the city of Mecca. He flees with his followers. He goes to another very important holy city of Medina, which is north of Mecca in the Arabian Peninsula. This act is known as the Hydra, uh, where he's it's this fleeing. And once he's there, he quickly sort of sees his new ideas and his faith and what he's talking about spread rapidly throughout the city and he ultimately becomes the leader. Um, Islam becomes the official religion of Medina um, and really stresses this important concept of Ummah, which loosely translated means community. Um, once he returns to Mecca, uh, he returns with almost, you know, depending on on what sort of account you you run into. Some people would describe it almost like a, an invading force. Others would say that it was no, it was just peaceful people returning to a city. Either way, uh, he returns to Mecca, a city that he was basically had to flee from um, earlier, and they welcome him with open arms. Okay. He goes to the Kaaba, which is a holy site, which you're going to see here in a, which you're going to see here in a little bit, which was supposedly built in the time of Abraham. It's been a site of pilgrimage even before 
Islam comes about, uh, and it's still an important landmark and a place of pilgrimage uh, today, which is one of the most important um, important of the five pillars of faith. He gets rid of all idols, um, considers them sacrilegious uh, to have any sort of idols depicted, which is why you really don't see a whole lot of statues or anything like that in the Islamic faith, even today. You are not to depict um, the Prophet Muhammad himself. It's considered sacrilegious. Okay. Uh, and by his death, he's able to unite the entire Arabian Peninsula. Now, his legacy, it, it, it's a big one. And ultimately, what happens to Islam and its ultimate split goes back to the death of Muhammad. Uh, he believed Arabs should have a scripture like the Jews and the Christians, people that they frequently just call the people of the book. Um, this is a faith-based social organization. It's no, not based on any sort of those old tribal relations. Once again, stressing the idea of equality. It was a vision of social justice. Once again, idea of equality. These are appealing things um, to people of the Arabian Peninsula at this time. And they're also ideas that had been stressed in previous not necessarily religions, but in previous empires, which is basically what's being formed here, uh, the early onset of Islamic empires. We've seen this in previous empires, whether you're talking about Justinian's Codex, whether you're talking about Octavian, a.k.a. Augustus Caesar, you're seeing these ideas uh, again, and they're, they're motivating factors. Islam means to submit to Allah or to God, okay? It's not a new religion, but it's considered sort of the best version. They don't discredit, they don't think Jesus is the Son of God, but they think he's a great prophet and apostle. But you know, they recognize some of these figures, whether it's Abraham, Moses, you know, the angel Gabriel, um, it's recognized. Uh, they talk about Judgment Day, Allah would reward the faithful with paradise, filled with eternal pleasure. He also warns of the apocalypse and the end of the world. So these are themes that are not necessarily brand new, but like we said, they're the best version. Um, the image, the popular image of heaven, and you don't see a whole lot of images, like we said, but the popular image of heaven is an oasis. It is this area in the middle of the desert in which you can have water, which you can have vegetation, and this paradise. Um, Hell is seen as the desert, this barren landscape. When we were talking about the Roman Empire, when we were talking about the organ after the fall of the Roman Empire and the organization of the Roman Catholic Church that develops and the uniformity to it, we don't really see that hierarchy ever develop in Islam. Typically, the people that they look at as the leaders are your mullahs, your teachers. Um, the only reason that they are there is because they have the best knowledge of the Quran. They've studied it. They know it very well. Once Islam spreads to North Africa, you're going, and in the Middle East as well, outside of the Arabian Peninsula, you're going to see a lot of colleges, universities pop up where this is the focus. And that's really the only sort of organized hierarchy, who do I go to sort of management that this religion has. A lot of time is going to be tied closely to the empires and the leaders and the military conquerors that develop. But, you know, that's a that's a separate outside of the church itself. Within the church itself there really isn't that organized hierarchy. You also have written collections um, concerning the life of Muhammad that um, start to pop up, the hadith. Uh, you're going to be reading these in class actually. And they're also addressing issues that are not specifically covered in the Quran. Um, if you're looking for a comparison, they're almost like the dialogues by um, um, Pope Gregory the Great or some of the exegesis writings previously of St. Augustine during the time of the Roman Empire. Okay? So we're ready to answer some questions on this uh, when you roll in the classics. Thanks for listening. See you next time.